Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for that very, very generous, very generous introduction. The abolition of slavery in the United States appears in retrospect to be so inevitable, of course slavery had to end, that it's difficult to recall how unlikely it seemed as late as 1860, the year that Lincoln was elected President of the United States. Slave owners had pretty much controlled the national government since the inception with slaveholder George Washington. The four million slaves in 1860 formed by far the country's largest concentration of property. Their economic worth exceeded the value of all the factories, railroads, and banks in the country combined. Racism was deeply entrenched in the North as well as in the South. Blacks, free as well as slave, had few rights anywhere. And abolitionists, abolitionists were despised minority. And yet no single event in the history of black Americans has a greater symbolic importance than emancipation. The moment was even captured in bronze. The Freedmen's Monument, located in Lincoln Park, Washington, D.C. That monument, for those, some of you may have seen it, depicts a benign-looking Abraham Lincoln. His right hand is grasping the Emancipation Proclamation, while his left hand is poised above the head of a humble, kneeling slave. The shackles on the slave's wrists are broken, symbolizing his freedom. That image, that image of Lincoln, the great emancipator, the great white father, is engraved on the American memory. In 1940, the monument itself graced a commemorative postage stamp honoring the 75th anniversary of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. The unveiling of the monument in April 1876 on the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination was a great event in Washington society. <coughs> President Grant was there, along with his cabinet officers, the Supreme Court justices, <coughs> other dignitaries. The principal speaker was Frederick Douglass, who had risen from the anonymity of slavery to become the nation's leading black spokesman. Douglas paid tribute to the martyred Abraham Lincoln. Paid tribute to him as indeed the man, as he called him, the man of our redemption. Under his leadership, Douglas declared, we saw ourselves gradually lifted from the depths of slavery to the heights of liberty and manhood. But Frederick Douglass went further. Whatever this festive occasion demanded, Douglass refused to gloss over the ambiguities in Lincoln's reputation as a great emancipator. <coughs> Truth compels me to admit 
even here in the presence of the monument we have erected to his memory. Abraham Lincoln was not, in the fullest sense of the word, either our man or our model. He was preeminently the white man's president. In his associations, in his habits of thought, in his policies, Douglas declared, Lincoln had shared the racial prejudices of most white Americans. He had been prepared to invoke and execute the constitutional guarantees regarding slave property. He had pledged himself to return fugitive slaves to their owners. He had stood ready to suppress any slave uprising even during the war. He had been ready and willing, ready and willing, said Douglas, to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity and the colored people to promote the welfare of the white people of this country. And looking out at the sea of faces in the audience, almost all of them white, Douglas told them first, midst, and last, you and yours were the object of his deepest affection and his most earnest solicitude. You are the children of Abraham Lincoln. We are at best only his stepchildren. Children by adoption, children by forces of circumstances and necessity. Abraham Lincoln accepted white supremacy. He never championed it. He hated slavery. But his ability to act on that feeling was always constrained by pragmatism, politics, public opinion, the law, the Constitution, his sense of timing, and the overriding need to hold the Union together. He took seriously his oath to uphold the Constitution, including the protection it afforded slavery. And during the war, he made clear on numerous occasions, beginning with his first inaugural address, beginning with that address, he made it very clear that he would not touch the institution of slavery where it then existed. And also that he was willing to preserve slavery if that would preserve the Union. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. More than a year after the war began, in September 1862, he offered the South the opportunity to come back into the Union with slavery intact. Abraham Lincoln was not an abolitionist, nor did he believe the American people would ever accept black people as equals. He said, and I quote, I am not, never have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I am not, nor have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. As long as both races remained in the United States, he said, as long as they remain in the United States, there must be the position of superior and inferior. <clears throat> 
and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having a superior position assigned to the white race. As late as 1862, he advocated a total separation of the races through government-subsidized colonization of blacks somewhere outside the United States, preferably in Liberia, in Africa, or Central America. And until the fall of 1862, the Civil War remained the limited war that Lincoln, Congress, and the Northern people had initially sanctioned. Then it became a different kind of war than either Lincoln or the Northern people envisaged or wanted was in large part a product of military necessity and the slaves themselves. The military stalemate, those mounting casualty lists, and they grew and grew in proportions Americans had never anticipated unfulfilled recruitment quotas, the rise of desertions, war weariness, growing anti-war sentiment at home, thousands of soldiers running away and returning home after their initial enlistment period had run out, the threat of European intervention, and perhaps most critically, the slaves themselves, the principal labor source and principal labor force in the Confederate war economy made their status a central and urgent issue by fleeing to the Union lines. More than a half million voted by their feet for freedom. All of these factors influenced Lincoln to abandon his inaugural pledge not to interfere with slavery and to contemplate emancipation as a necessary measure to win the war, as a weapon to preserve the Union. I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. So no one could reasonably have predicted, as I suggested in 1860, that the emancipation of some four million slaves would come within five years. On the eve of the Civil War, plantation agriculture was more profitable, slavery more entrenched, slave owners more prosperous, and the so-called slave power, more dominant within the South, if not in the nation, than it had ever been. Without slavery, without slavery there would have been no civil, white, no civil war. Without the Civil War, there would have been no emancipation. Any peaceable abolition of slavery, Lincoln himself thought, would take at least 100 years. Perhaps he was thinking of the Civil Rights Movement, who knows. So the Emancipation Proclamation, when it finally came, would be celebrated in history, but it was not, for what it was not. It was not a profound moral commitment to black freedom. Indeed, the Emancipation Proclamation, read it someday, or maybe not, was a cold, legalistic, and boring document. It was devoid of any moral content. Lincoln chose his words carefully. He defended emancipation as, in his words, a fit and necessary war measure aimed at suppressing the rebellion issued by him as commander-in-chief 
of the armed forces in a calculated effort to maximize public support it justified emancipation not as a triumph of liberty over slavery but on the grounds of military necessity so the emancipation proclamation freed slaves only where the president had no authority to free them. That is, it applied only to those parts of the South still in rebellion. It left slavery intact in the loyal slave states in areas that were then held by the Union Army. Lincoln set those slaves free that he did not control and kept those in bondage that he did control. Lincoln himself estimated that some 200,000 slaves gained their freedom under the Emancipation Proclamation. That is about one in 20 in the total number of slaves. Now Lincoln had his reasons. The consummate politician an embattled and unpopular president of a democratic nation in a, in a battle for survival. He knew he would have difficulty persuading the northern public, most of whom embraced white supremacy, to accept, accept such a radical move. So he chose then to rest his action on the narrowest possible ground. When black freedom came, it must come as a war measure, not at the climax of a humanitarian crusade. It's been called, rightfully so I think, it's been called the most brilliantly crafted performance in American political history. Once the proclamation was issued, Lincoln defended it, even when it's unpopularly threatened to cost him re-election. He would call it in the end, my greatest and most enduring contribution. He would call it the central act of my administration and the great event of the 19th century. Whatever his limits, despite its pedestrian language, the Emancipation Proclamation remains the most radical, the most revolutionary act ever enacted by an American president. Employing massive military power, Lincoln chose to attack and cancel what the United States Constitution ostensibly protected, an enormous investment in human property, private property. In doing so, he altered the very nature of the Civil War, turning the otherwise meaningless carnage into something higher and nobler. A pragmatic move by a pragmatic president, the Emancipation Proclamation had revolutionary ramifications. Incidentally, Lincoln did not mention in the proclamation two of his favorite ideas, compensation for slaveholders and the colonization of freed blacks in Africa or Central America. The same consideration of military necessity by which Lincoln justified emancipation, made possible the recruitment and use of black soldiers. But some 200,000 black recruits inducted into the Union Army, the Civil War became a very different kind of war. Now even a film is as good as glory, is able to capture that extraordinary moment in our history, 
when uniformed and armed black men, most of them recently slaves, marched to the southern countryside as an army of occupation, as an army of liberation. For many southern whites, no moment, no moment in the entire Civil War brought them more anguish, fear, or humiliation. For many black Americans, no moment of the war instilled in them greater pride and satisfaction. They had become movers of their own. And indeed, that's an important point for us to recall. Excuse me a minute. So they were not passive observers, but active participants in the liberation. Now we soldiers are men, when the first time in our lives, declared a black sergeant, now we can look our old masters in the face. They used to sell and whip us, and we did not dare say one word. Now we isn't afraid, if they meet us, to run the bayonet through them. The inescapable tragedy of the Civil War is that it had to be fought. With the Emancipation Proclamation and the recruitment of African American soldiers, Lincoln now believed the Civil War had become a struggle for the soul of America. Recognizing the limitations of his wartime authority and hoping to settle the proclamation's amb ambiguous legal standing, Lincoln would press in 1863 and 1864 for passage of a constitutional amendment the 13th Amendment that would ensure the abolition of slavery. By March 1865, Lincoln was prepared to say publicly that the Civil War was a war about slavery. In Lincoln's words, to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend slavery was the object for which the insurgents would break up the Union, break up the Union under the banner of the Stars and Bars, the Confederate flag. You know, many American children are still reading textbooks that refuse to accept this critical point. And so as we move into the first years of the sesquicentennial commemorating the Civil War, we still need to get our history straight. None of the great battles, not even Antietam, Shiloh, or Gettysburg, compared in sheer drama with the way in which the Civil War came to be transformed to a social revolution of such far-reaching proportions. The story of how the slaves helped to free themselves and undermine the authority of the plunder class is replete with drama, paradox, and irony. Only later, only later in retrospect, did Frederick Douglass come to object the impression that had been left by the Freedmen's Monument that he had helped to dedicate. This monument, as I said, had shown the slave on his knees when, said Douglas, a more manly attitude would have been indicative of freedom. What no doubt troubled Douglas was the impression left by the monument the slaves had waited patiently and passively for the white man, Massa Lincoln, and the Union Army to break the chains of bondage. But Frederick Douglass knew better. 
So did tens of thousands of enslaved black men and women who had taken the initiative in claiming their freedom. And so did countless southern white men and white women who had seen their property vanish and would have to bear witness as many of the free slaves chose to remain with them, who chose to remain with them, turned into unrecognizable men and women. What the Civil War did was to sweep away the pretenses, dissolve the illusions, and lay bare the tensions and instability inherent in the master-slave relationship. For many white families who owned slaves, the Civil War came to be a terrible moment of truth. That is, it claimed the master who claimed the master, it taught the master who claimed to know the Negro best, that he knew the Negro least of all. They had mistaken the outward demeanor of his slaves for their inner feelings. They had mistaken the docilities, supposedly, of the slaves for contentment. And indeed, they had mistaken the deference and accommodation of the slaves for submission. I got one mind for white folks to see, a blues man sang, another for what I know is me. Got one mind for white folks to see, another for what I know is me. He don't know, he don't know my mind. And for those of you who recently saw a movie, Django would have readily agreed. The almost studied indifference of some slaves was perhaps most troubling of all. For white families to determine how their slaves felt about the war could be a downright frustrating and exasperating experience. When questioned about the war, Slaves so shaped their responses, as they usually did, to the tone of the question and requirements of the occasion, and some sought refuge in a pretense of incomprehension. Well, you see, Master, when elderly slave responded to this question, came from an old nigger like me to know anything about politics. But when the slave was pressed further to indicate his preference for the Union or the Confederacy. He very carefully thought about that question. He paused for a moment, and he then said what indeed he felt. He said he would not, that, he, but that he's on the Lord's side. I'm on the Lord's side. Well, every plantation, every farm, every town had its own story. With the passage of time, the white South would be very selective in recalling what happened. Choosing to focus and those slaves who in their behavior and demeanor conformed to white expectations. You remember Gone with the Wind? Every white slave-holding family, or so it seemed, had its favorite story about the old black faithfuls who remained steadfast to the very end, even protesting their freedom. In South Carolina, after her master had been taken prisoner, a loyal house slave clung to the trunk, containing family valuables, earning for herself the highest possible praise 
a white man could bestow. <coughs> she's black outside, her owner declared, but she's white inside. Well, the Black South had its stories, too. The experience of emancipation would enter into family histories and into folklore. Like their white, owner, white owners, those who had been slaves retained and passed on to future generations emotionally charged memories of this critical moment in their lives. In interviews with former slaves conducted 70 years after the war, no event, no event would stand out with greater clarity than the day they learned of their freedom. Even as many of the descendants of the slaves moved into the urban north in the early 20th century, the stories, the legends, the songs that came out of emancipation followed them and assumed a special place in the folk history of African Americans. That was how Catherine Morgan came to learn of her great grandmother, Caddy. The strong willed and defiant slave had been sold many times in her life, but had never ceased to torment her owners. The Caddy legends, as Catherine Morgan heard them from her mother, served as buffers, she said, to overcome the anger and the frustration she felt as a young black woman growing up in a hostile white society. And of the many stories she enjoyed most of all hearing about the day her great-grandmother learned of her freedom. This is how Catherine Morgan's mother passed on the story. Caddy had been sold to a man in Mississippi. It was terrible to be sold in Mississippi. In fact, it was terrible to be sold anywhere. She had been put to work in the fields for running away again. She was hoeing a crop when she heard that General Lee had surrendered. You know who General Lee was? He was the man who was working for the South in the Civil War. When General Lee surrendered, that meant that all the colored people were free. Caddy drew to, threw down that hoe. She marched herself up to the big house. Then she looked around and she found the mistress. She went over to the mistress. She flipped up her dress and she told the white woman to do something. She said it mean and ugly. And this is what she said. Kiss my ass. But whenever the mother repeated that story, Catherine Morgan prevailed upon her to repeat that part over and over again, she said. Her caddy picked up her dress. And afterwards, she said, she recalled, I'd go to my room and I would practice living up my dress and saying the same thing. Kiss my ass. Indeed, she said, as a teenager, I remember how wonderful I thought it would be to be able to tell the whole white world to kiss my ass. If the stories of emancipation invited such flights into fantasy, a century later, one can only begin to imagine the initial impact in the lives of those who experienced it. Very few reacted with the directness of a caddy, but no white family knew for certain what to expect. That is, few knew their blacks well enough <coughs> to be able to determine when a long time black faithful might reach the breaking point and as a free person no longer feel obliged to contain their rage and resentment within her, no, no longer feel it necessary to tolerate the impudence and the sassiness of the white family she served. But one can only speculate as to how many shared the feelings of Aunt Delia, the, blank, the black cook in a North Carolina family, 
who spit in the biscuits and pissed in the coffee, get back at her white folks. Freed from slavery, black men and women found ways to exercise and define, define their freedom. They might slow down the pace of work, haggle over wages and conditions, refuse to submit to punishment, violate racial etiquette, move to a new place, locate families, pray in their own churches. What emancipation introduced into the lives of black men and women was a leap of confidence and the ability to effect changes in their lives without deferring to whites. Few did so with greater eloquence than Jordan Anderson, a former Tennessee slave who escaped from his master during the war. In 1865, his old master asked him to return to the plantation and resume his labor. This is the truth, the reply that Jordan Anderson dictated and had sent. Dayton, Ohio, August the 7th, 1865. To my old master, Colonel P. H. Anderson, Big Spring, Tennessee. Sir, I got your letter and was glad to find that you had not forgotten Jordan and that you wanted me to come back and live with you again, promising to do better than anybody else can. It would do me good to go back to the dear old home again and see Miss Mary and Miss Art Martha and Helen, Esther Green and Lee. Give my love to them and tell them that I hope we'll meet in the better world, if not in this. I want to know particularly what the good chance uh, is you propose to give me. I'm doing tolerably well here. I get $25 a month with food and clothing. I have a comfortable home for Mandy. The folks here call her Mrs. Anderson. And the children, Millie, Jane, and Grundy, go to school and are learning well. The teacher says Grundy has a head for a preacher. They go to Sunday school and Mandy and me attend church regularly. We are kindly treated. Sometimes we overhear others saying, well, them colored were slaves, you know, down in Tennessee. The children feel hurt when they hear such remarks. But I tell them there was no disgrace in Tennessee to belong to Colonel Anderson. Many dark kids would have been proud, as I used to was, to call you master. Now, if you will write and say what wages you will give me, I'll be better able to decide whether it would be to my advantage to move back again. Mandy says she'd afraid, be afraid to go back without some proof that you're sincerely disposed to treat us kindly and justly. And we've concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we serve you. <laughs> Now, this will make us forget and forgive old scores and rely on your justice and friendship in the future. I served you faithfully for 35, 32 years, and Mandy, 20 years, at $25 a month from me and $2 a week from Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest <laughs> by the time our wages have been kept back and deduct what you paid for our clothing and three doctor's visits to eight to me in pulling a tooth for Mandy and the balance will show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money to buy Adams Express in care of B. Winters Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. If you fail to pay us for faithful labors in the past, we can have little faith in your promises in the future. 
and trust the good maker has opened your eyes to the wrongs which you and your fathers have done to me and my fathers. He making us toil for you for generations without recompense. Here I draw my wages every Saturday night, but in Tennessee there was never any payday for the Negroes any more than for the horses and cows. In answering this letter, please state if there would be any safety for my Millie and Joan, Jane, who are not growing up, and both of them good-looking girls. You know how it was with poor Matilda and Catherine. Rather stay, rather stay here and starve. And die if it came to that, than have my girls brought to shame by the violence and wickedness of their young masters. You'll also please state if there has been any schools open for the colored children in your neighborhood. The great desire of my life now is to give my children an education and have them form virtuous habits. OPS, say howdy to George Carter and thank him for taking the pistol from you when you're shooting at me. <laughs> from your old servant, Jordan Anderson. I chose in my book, Been the Storm So Long, to publish that letter in its entirety. I, fed, I said that to move any words, remove any words, would, be a tra would, would make a travesty of it. And it's a very revealing letter in all respects. And we subsequently identified from the U.S. Census the name of Jordan Anderson. We found a photograph of him as he looked, stern, forbidding in some ways, I suppose, the long beard. Well, how many Jordan Andersons came out of slavery? That's, of course, difficult to determine. But in 1865, more than one former slaveholding family found their place overrun with men and with women who evince the same spirit and the same determination to work under conditions that would in no way compromise the newly won freedom. And indeed, what happened to that spirit and that determination would profoundly affect race relations in the nation for the next century. A few months before issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln warned a black delegation at the White House that the abolition of slavery would no doubt leave unaltered the fundamental racial attitudes of white people. The riots that broke out during and after the war in places like New York, Memphis, New Orleans, Riots aimed at solidifying white supremacy were forceful reminders that Lincoln knew his people all too well. You ask, what am I grumbling about? A black clergyman wrote in January of 1863. Has not the president issued his Emancipation Proclamation? Yes, he has. But the hearts of the people, the hearts of the people, have not. On March the 4th, 1865, Lincoln was sworn in for a second term. For the first time in American history, black soldiers marched in the inaugural parade. Some half the audience was black, as were many of the whites. I mean, there were many visitors who went to the White House that day. The president opened the White House to black guests as no president had before. Two days after, Link, after Lee surrendered, President Lincoln made a tentative move toward black suffrage.
He suggested that literate freed slaves and those who had fought in the Union Army be given the right to vote. Standing in the crowd, listening to the president that evening with John Wilkes Booth. When he heard those words, Booth was said to have turned to a companion and snarl, that means nigger citizenship. Now by God, I'll put him through. That's the last speech he'll ever make. And it was. Three days later, he was shot and killed Lincoln. The first casualty in a bloody counter-revolutionary war of terror to undo the most important achievement of the Civil War, black freedom. Now that war, that war lasted almost a century. The state of Mississippi, for example, ratified the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery on March the 16th, 1995. The Civil War, the Civil War ended slavery. It did not end racism. Slavery is dead, the Cincinnati Inquirer editorialized in 1865. The Negro is not. There is the misfortune. Neither side anticipated the transportation, transportation of the Civil War into a struggle over the meaning of freedom in America. <coughs> Under slavery, racial boundaries had been clearly established. But what were the proper boundaries of black freedom? A former Tennessee slave recalled a day the overseer had told them that they were free. They asked him, how free? How free? How free was free? How that question would be played out would again profoundly affect race relations in the nation for the next century. How free was free? Did it include civil and political rights? The vote? Access to public space? Access to libraries? The public transport? The equal medical care? Did it mean access to equal educational opportunities? and the right to work their own crops on their own land. And what are the wages, the compensation owed them for the past and the future? What the white South lost on the battlefields of the Civil War, it would ultimately retake through terrorism, murder, rape, and the hangman's noose. An American terrorism that reasserted the primacy of the white race. That suppressed political activity and crushed the effort to create an interracial democracy out of the ashes of the Civil War. The mass of black people, some 90% of them, the 90% of them still live out their lives in a repressive and static South. The great mass of black Americans tried to make something of their freedom. You gotta make it mean something an enslaved insisted. All that mean is you've got a long row to hoe and ain't got no plow, ain't got no mule, 
What good is freedom if you can't do nothing with it? The present and the future. As blues man Willie Brown sang, the present and the future offer no comfort. Can't tell my future. I can't tell my past. Oh Lord, it seems like every minute should gonna be my last. Oh man, it seems like hours, and hours seems like days. Yes, minutes seem like hours. Hours seem like days. The fundamental issue of the Civil War was and remains the meaning, the meaning of freedom. When the Civil War ended, the Civil War, in many ways, the Civil War, or a struggle began over how it would be remembered, how the war would be remembered. In June of 1894, Frederick Douglass, the ex slave and abolitionist, addressed a crowd assembled at Mount Hope Cemetery in Rochester, when nine months later, he would himself be laid to, race, to rest. What was bad before the war and during the war, he told them, has not been made good since the war. Whatever else I may forget, I shall not forget the difference between those who fought for liberty and those who fought slavery. It was a theme Frederick Douglass had been sounding for almost 30 years. The national amnesia must not obscure the crimes of the Confederacy. The spirit of national reconciliation must not blot out the moral dimension of the Civil War that there was, Douglas said, a right side and a wrong side, which no sentiment, which indeed no sentimentality, ought to cause us to forget. And indeed, during the centennial of the Civil War, it should never be forgotten. Some years later, in the kind of postscript to this talk, W.E.B. Du Bois, who become one of the leading black spokesmen in the 20th century, published an essay in the Crisis magazine, the organ of the NAACP, in May of 1922. Du Bois wrote, that Lincoln was one large jumble of contradictions. He was big enough to be inconsistent, cruel yet merciful, peace-loving yet a fighter, despising Negroes <coughs> and letting them fight and vote protecting slavery and freeing slaves. He was a man, a big, inconsistent, brave man. With so many angry and hurt readers flooded Du Bois' mailbox that he felt it necessary to write a second essay, the next issue of the magazine, in which he defended his position. And he defended it this way. I love him. I love Lincoln, that is. Not because he was perfect, but because he was not. And yet, triumph. Thank you very much.
vision could evolve. Now, there are, there are people who have written about Lincoln, many have written about Lincoln. And when you have a couple of weeks, you may have a very different view of that. Uh, more recently, there is a book, um, I think it's called Freedom, Nation, Freedom Nationwide, or Freedom National, in which uh, the historian, Jim Oakes, a very good historian, argues that Lincoln, from the very outset of the Civil War, had in mind exactly what happened during the war. Didn't know what would happen after the war. I happen to still belong to that old, older school of thinking, represented by historians like James McPherson, Eric Foner, that he evolved, that he showed growth based on experience and based on his perceptions of reality. What I wanted to include in tonight's talk, however, was the fact that there were still other actors and actresses, if you want to call it that, that's not a longer accepted word, but there were other actors and actresses who had a tremendous impact on Lincoln and on the country who had often been neglected in those histories of the war and those who the ex-slaves themselves. Uh, I referred to a number of ex-slaves had said during the interviews conducted with them during the Civil War, I mean, during the, not during the Civil War, during the 1930s, in fact, um, which had this has been a project of the WPA or one branch of the WPA, which was to make a record of the what happened during slavery of those slaves who were still still living. And I read every one of those interviews, there are thousands of them, all very different, many of them very different. But as I said, over one, one impression that overwhelmed everything else was how they felt and how they acted when they heard of their freedom. And I tried to be as faithful as I could to that uh, record. But even when the book was published, it didn't start so long, there were historians who were very generous to me, I thought, in their reviews and remarks. But one of them in particular, a good friend, uh, Carl Degler, uh, who liked the book, but he said, I cannot believe the, the story of Jordan Anderson. Do you have any, have any real evidence to prove there was a Jordan Anderson? Well, at that time, I had no real evidence, except that I accepted the letter that was First, the placed in a Ohio newspaper, and then was contained in a little, a little, uh, little book in which freedmen themselves had participated that a white abolitionist, Lydia Child, had edited. And I thought, aha, uh -huh, but here and even here, that only added to his suspicions that some white abolitionists had been up to it. Well, in fact, the white abolitionist may have listened to Jordan Anderson relate his story. But in any event, some enterprising scholars came upon Jordan Anderson. Uh, I think I even have a picture of him here to prove that he existed. And the US Census helped out as well. Welcome to the Hall of Black Fame, Jordan Anderson. You are now recognized. And that's what he looks like as stern as an old black preach, preacher that he was. Um, but anyway, I, going back to your original question, um, I think Lincoln, like many others, grew a great deal during the war and during after, and after the war, but many did not. And that's the difficulties of the Reconstruction and, uh, and everything that happened after that. Yes? that 
the nation had gained new land. Yeah. And, and so we think, how could anyone have considered that? But did they consider that maybe all the lives lost would not be worth? I mean, that they, that they might have said, let's, let's separate for a while yeah. and see. Indeed, many have held that point of view. Um, one historian, a very fine, noted historian, uh, David Potter, in fact, in a book which was published in the 1930s, a book on the Civil War, uh, added up the number of men and women, North and South, who died during the Civil War, and then added up the number of blacks who achieved their emancipation, you know, achieved freedom one way or the other, either through the Emancipation Proclamation or through their own efforts. And he came up with, a, I don't have all the, I, I'm terrible at remembering figures, which is too bad for a historian, but uh, nevertheless, uh, he came out with the conclusion that uh, so many whites, the number he gave the number, had died so that this number, small, much smaller number of African Americans could gain their freedom. And he said, was it really worth it? Well, <laughs> depends on, of course, who answers that question. But for many Americans, not just black Americans, <coughs> it was worth it, yes. Because that war would have been fought again. It would have been fought all over again. Uh, my contention is still that the Civil War or some war of that type was necessary if there was to be anything approaching freedom. The idea that freedom would have come gradually in the post-Civil War years, well, that's wishful thinking in, in, in many ways. And we have only to know the experience of Nazi Germany, to you know that something called freedom and extermination, I mean that slavery and extermination, can coexist well into the 20th century. So I, whether it would have taken 100 years, as Lincoln thought, or even longer, I, I don't know. I would, wouldn't venture to predict. But certainly there were places in, this, in the country where in 1900, life seemed very much the same as during bondage. And yet it wasn't the same. Because throughout the late 19th century and then into the 20th century, black people were learning. And they learned during the Civil War, and they also learned during World War I that they would not necessarily come home to an appreciative country. They would not necessarily come home to an appreciative country after World War II. But that ultimately, their sacrifice in the military and their sacrifices they were willing to make domestically said something about their yearning for real freedom. Yes? I was wondering, since things were so slow and um, evolving toward equality even in, in the North for so many decades, is, is there any information on um, whether most uh, slaves who got away from the slave catchers and got into Canada, uh, did most of them feel they had a better shake there and stay there, or did, did they come back? Oh, I think people felt that they had better conditions there. There was a greater degree of tolerance of course, they were never overwhelming in numbers, which helped matters, because there's always the fear, uh, immense in many areas of the country, that if they were invaded by, invaded in the, the term that, that was used, invaded by freed blacks, that their own supremacy might be challenged. Um, yeah, most felt they had done much better, better materially than they would have if they remained in the South. He had many returned after the war. I don't know what percentage actually returned, uh, but nothing approaching the Great Migration, which was, of course, the Great Migration of Southern white, Southern blacks to afford themselves of opportunities in an industrializing North in the late 19th, the late 19th century, and then in the early 20th century. I mean, the wave of the Great Migration 
into the north that would transform the north, the urban north, came during the early 20th century. And then would be repeated again in the aftermath of World War II and during World War II. When it was seen that conditions would be better for them uh, in the north. Indeed, this seemed very real when these uh, great migrations occurred because the, the opportunities were often there. There were, there were opportunities in the industrial north in the least in the late 19th century, but particularly in the 20th century. And particularly after the immigration from Europe ceased to be as overwhelming as it was earlier. So the migration of the late 19th century was still overwhelmed by the migration by immigration from Europe. But with World War I, that came to an end. And therefore, you had the even larger migration that was yet to come. Time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> you pick. Uh, when I was in high school, that was a year or two ago, <laughs> my history professor or not professor, history teacher, argued that the reason for the Civil War was the economy of the country. Yeah. That the northern industrial behemoth was uh, destroying the South. So it was an economic issue, mm -hmm. not a slavery issue. Yeah. I just wonder what your thoughts are well, many of our finest historians accepted that argument. Uh, Charles Beard, who many thought was a, one of the reigning historians of the, of the North, accepted that explanation. Uh, they called it economic determinism because it also affected their feelings about other matters, such as the United States Constitution. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it was, a, it was a common frame of uh, thought. And it was also accepted by Southerners, white Southerners, who believed after all that they had been overwhelmed by military, overwhelming military and economic strength demonstrated in the North, uh, and that the whole thing was about economics. Um, but I think that, and that was pretty much the, the attitude of the high school teachers that I had at the same time. Um, I, I think, however, they were wrong. And uh, I think the argu our argument that uh, there was a moral side to the, the Civil War as well, and that it, it should not be kept you know, uh, secret. Uh, and also, I think that the crimes of the Confederacy had to be more thoroughly examined, and they were. Um, but you, it was a popular way of thinking about the Civil War, and I, as I said, I you know, encountered the same, the same thing. And I, uh, uh, my first exposure to the Civil War and Reconstruction, in fact, uh, and slavery, <laughs> was such that I asked my high school teacher, <laughs> I had reason to doubt that all this was true in the textbook. I asked my high school teacher for some equal time well, not equal time, but uh, <laughs> I wasn't, I, wasn't uh, I didn't try to flaunt anything. But uh, she said, very graciously accepted, and she said, you have the next class hour to, to do what you want to do. And my object was to refute the textbook and say the textbook was wrong on slavery. That was a, that was a time when Samuel A. Morrison and uh, Henry Steele Cominger, two very respected historians in a textbook used in most Ivy League colleges, began their section on slavery by talking about, well, you know, Sambo never had it so good <laughs> as during slavery. They had enjoyed a certain kind of security that they could never have secured else in any other way. They were, or, or the idea of slavery as an important uh, time of schooling <coughs> for savage Africans, schooling in industrial arts and schooling in, in, other, in other respects in other respects as well. Well, uh, I wanted to challenge the textbook. I wanted to challenge the textbook on slavery and on reconstruction. That was a huge uh, feat. So I went off to the Santa Barbara Public Library, good old public library with 
bless them all. <laughs> Went off to the public library and checked out W.E.B. Du Bois' book, Black Reconstruction. She had a very different argument about slavery and about Reconstruction. And I marched into the classroom fearlessly uh, with that in mind. And I finished my presentation. I thought it was absolutely brilliant, of course. <laughs> And I finally had done what I had to be had to be done. This myth had been destroyed. Why the teacher looked at the classroom and she said, Now class, you must remember that Leon is bitterly pro labor. <laughs> and I wondered what did this have to do with what I had just said? Why would you bring up my remarks about unions as I expressed them also in class? And I think that she felt had somehow or other soiled my attempt to refute the sacred textbook on such an issue as slavery. Um, and then I came to Berkeley, and the textbook was by John D. Hicks, one of the greatest historians of that period, and a member of the Berkeley faculty. And Hicks made the same argument about Reconstruction, about slavery that I had heard before time and again. But then I took my freshman course in history at Berkeley, and it was taught by a young assistant professor, Kenneth M. Stamp. And wow, that was a that was confirmation, actually. It wasn't, I, I learned a great deal. Of course, I did learn a great deal from Stamp. But it's also confirmation what I've been arguing for many, many years. And uh, he wrote the first, and to me, the greatest, I mean, the first refutation of that uh, old South argument. And uh, it's published under the name of the Peculiar Institution. Remains to my way of thinking the best one volume history of, of slavery. Uh, to exist even today. And then I would go on and get my PhD from, no doubt, the uh, best historian I thought at that time, uh, Kenneth M. Stamp. And also my second year in, uh, at Berkeley was also another learning experience. Um, oh no, the, it was the same, I'm sorry, the same year, the teaching assistant, the graduate teaching assistant in this course said, well, I think somebody would like to meet you. And I said, well, that's fine. I'm, that's just a freshman. What, what, what does someone want me out of me? And he had came, you know, told me to come to his place. And uh, I didn't know who this was going to be. And I sat there for a while, and in marched, I recognized him immediately. It was W.E.B. Du Bois, <laughs> who happened to be in Berkeley. I think he was, I'm not sure he was under federal indictment yet or not. <laughs> but uh, he was there and did not have great audiences. He just was there to talk about some of his favorite subjects. And, uh, but I, what he, why he wanted to see me, why did he want to see me in particular? Well, he didn't want to see me in particular, Leon Lidwack. He wanted to see any new student who was taking American history and ask him, he really wanted to ask, what were my views about slavery and Reconstruction? And uh, there's a whole chapter, a whole appendix, part of a, his book, Black Reconstruction, is a survey of U.S. textbooks at that time, which were horrendous, horrendous. And I told him, well, what I'm learning from the textbook is exactly what you warned us about in Black Reconstruction. Let me tell you what Professor Stamp is saying. Well, he was astonished. He was astonished and encouraged. Encouraged to think that maybe the future might be different. 